from Parts Unknown. I'm Mr. Hargrave, and this is my review of AEW Collision that happened on 7-22-2023 in Newark, New Jersey at the Prudential Center. Now, a little background before we get into this, and I just want to talk very briefly about my thoughts and feelings on how Collision has gone till date. Um, I have not enjoyed Collision, the television show. I very much enjoy AEW wrestling, AEW wrestlers. I have nothing against CM Punk or anybody who's on this roster. I just don't feel it's as quality of a TV show as Dynamite or even as quality as Rampage. Now, I know you might be lighting me up down in the comments right now, but bear with me. This is ultimately going to be a very glowing review of Collision overall because I really feel that this episode of Collision has turned the corner. And this episode in particular has shown us something that other episodes have been lacking. Not that the other episodes have not had their high points. I cannot deny the majesty of the tag match between FTR and Bullet Club Gold. I'm a huge Jay White fan. So that's like a big draw for me on Collision. So seeing him showcase in such an amazing match, the highlight of Collision to date wrestling wise, Absolutely, and I'm going to watch this weekly no matter how bad this show is. Guys, I've watched every episode of Dark and Dark Elevation that ever was, so I'm not going to shy away from anything. Now, this episode in particular, as I break this down kind of moment by moment, match by match, not only will I be able to break down this episode match by match as a viewer of the television show, but also this was the first wrestling event that I was able to attend live in about 30 years. That's right, about 30 years ago, a young Mr. Hartgrave was sent into the Sullivan Arena in Anchorage, Alaska. That's right, guys. I was born in Anchorage, Alaska, and the WWF came there 30 years ago. I think I actually saw it a couple of times. And uh, that's the last time I've been to a live wrestling event. So thank you actually so much to my producer who scored me some tickets for this, for me and my family to go to this. And wow, I mean, that in itself is like a whole other video, just like the live experience. But as I go through this, I will actually have a couple of notes that I can bring to this that uh, I was able to gather from being there live that you wouldn't have known if you weren't there. Let's start with this pyro. Yes, it was as extreme as it looked on TV. It went on forever, and yes, New Jersey loves Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks goes on to cut what I could only say is a extremely heel promo, but New Jersey cheers for it nonetheless, and this is going to be a trend that carries out throughout this whole show is New Jersey loves Ricky Starks, doesn't want to like CM Punk, and things are just going to get weirder and weirder from there. I mean, I get it, guys. He looks like The Rock. He's more like The Pebble. His promos are awful. But I get the idea that, I, I, look, I like Ricky Starks. I like everybody on the AEW roster. Please don't take this as me not liking Ricky Starks. But this man is behaving as a heel. He cheats to win. He talks about his Prada bags and his, his or Prada shoes and Gucci handbags. Like, this is stuff that should be getting booed. New Jersey, you should be booing this man. But no, New Jersey loves them. And I think we have a lot of, you know, 2019 hardcore AEW fans in the audience. And it makes sense, guys. He's been here since the start. Let's give Ricky his due. I absolutely get it. But at no point did the Ricky Starks face turn ever happen. Ricky Starks is a heel, everybody. Can we remember that? We won't remember that. But I was just kind of hoping we could remember that. But we won't, we're not going to remember that. So in brief, the Ricky Starks promo is, hey, I did what I had to do to win. I've won. I'm the champ. Hey, Jushin Thunder Liger, let's not really talk about that. CM Punk comes out and confronts Ricky Starks and says, you know, you may have beaten me, but just know, Ricky, you had to cheat to do it. Now, the crowd is booing CM Punk and, well, let's say they're, look, I, I've lived in New Jersey now for about 20 years. And I actually consider myself as a New Jersey local. I know I told you I come from Alaska, but I, I've adapted to New Jersey and I get it. We're very loud, we're very obnoxious, and we're very fickle. 
And that's what you're going to see with this crowd. We just kind of go where the wind takes us. Yeah, we're very hot. We're hot headed. We're going to fly off the handle every five minutes. And, and that's what's going to happen here. And I'm going to throw New Jersey under the bus a couple of times because our, our takes are really weird, man. There is a good portion of the audience, though, like my section. We all knew what was up. It's CM Punk time. This is CM Punk's show. We wouldn't have come to this show unless we like CM Punk. Some people didn't get the memo, so they're booing CM Punk. Other times they're cheering CM Punk. After CM Punk delivers that extreme burn to Ricky Starks, he's walking back down the aisle and Ricky Starks mentions his empty bag is no different than CM Punk's empty bag and would like a shot at whatever might be in CM Punk's bag. A lot of talk about bags. This pisses CM Punk off and he approaches the ring and the crowd kind of gets behind him because now they are finally understanding that maybe they would like to see CM Punk beat Ricky Stark's ass here in New Jersey. And then comes in Christian Cage delivering the line of what might be the entire year when he says, what kind of man walks around with a belt that doesn't belong to him with zero irony in his voice whatsoever as he holds on to Luchasaurus's TNT title? God bless you, Christian Cage. I was never a Christian Cage fan until this very moment, actually. I've, I've always appreciated the man's work, but I didn't truly understand what an artist Christian Cage was until I saw him deadpan deliver this line. I am now a Christian Cage fan for life. With all this talk of championships and TNT championships, it summons Darby Allen and the surprise of the night. Now, this was not announced. We did not know Darby Allen was going to be in the building. So the place is mad hype for Darby Allen. If there's one person they like more than Ricky Starks, and we'll talk more about this later. It's Darby Allen. So for now, Darby Allen is the most popular man in the room. And he throws down a challenge for the, uh, for, I don't know, I guess no title, no belts, no stakes, but he just throws down the challenge of a tag match between himself, CM Punk, Ricky Starks, and whoever the TNT champion may be. Perhaps the man who's taken so much LSD, he thinks that he's a giant dinosaur. But no, Christian Cage accepts. And with that, that segment comes to a close and on to our first match. And that's right, baby, the juice is loose. I'll tell you one thing that really made me proud about New Jersey. There was a lot of disappointing parts about the crowd reactions throughout this show, especially during the main event. But one thing that really made me happy and one thing I was really curious about is, is Bullet Club Gold working? Is it going to work in America? Is Jay White going to be able to win over America like he did in Japan? Is it going to work here? Well, if New Jersey is anything to say about it, yes. When they were rolling the match promos and telling us which, which matches we're going to see tonight and Jay White and Juice Robinson hit the screen, the crowd explodes and when they come out, Jay White gets a proper hero's welcome, although they are definitely the heels in this match, but they are so much more over than top flight, you know, wounded top flight. Is that what we're going to call them? Broken wing top flight? Man, I feel really bad uh, for Darius Martin, I believe, uh, getting injured like that and not being able to, to wrestle for such a long time. But uh, yeah, no, Bullet Club Gold definitely over with the New Jersey audience. And that made me really excited. I was really happy to see that it is working. The Jay White experiment in America, it's got some legs, guys. People know who Jay White is and we're really excited to see him do some stuff. So let's pull the trigger on him. This is a kind of a, not a squash match. You know, it actually probably takes a little bit too long. I, I think we need to be selling Jay and Juice as stronger, you know, competitors. Like able, I mean, these guys took FTR for one hour last week. Why is this match taking more than like, I don't know, a few minutes? Anyways, Jay White does his Jay White thing where he, he acts like he's half dead for most of the match and then rises from the grave, delivers a switchblade, and this thing is over, on to the next one. It's Miro. People love Miro. Miro does a squash match. There's really nothing to say here. Um, I don't get Miro. I'm sure I will someday. Look, just, Full disclosure, anybody that I kind of run into the first time in AEW that I haven't followed from outside, like I didn't follow Miro in WWE, I'm sorry, many apologies. 
I just don't like you for a bit. I just don't care about you. I'm sure at some point Miro will do something that I care about. I know he had a good long run previously. I did watch all that. It just didn't click for me. Miro has not clicked for me. I do love his promos. I think they're very funny. But this match uh, was nothing. Absolutely filler. 100%. This is the match that really got me to make this video. House of Black versus The Acclaimed. Now, I thought going into this that House of Black would be favored by the New Jersey audience, giving their previous, or during the East Coast previous history with Malachi Black and Cody Rhodes. If you don't remember, going into the East Coast, Cody Rhodes was not being booed as much as when he left the East Coast. This is way back in the day, back when he was still with AW, right? And he was feuding with Malachi Black going into Grand Slam. When he hit Grand Slam versus Malachi Black, it is there that the New York audience decided to let Cody Rhodes know which horse they were backing, and it was going to be Malachi Black. Ever since then, anyone who tends to feud with the House of Black tends to come out on the lesser side of the crowd favor, right? Everyone loves the House of Black. Except, everyone also loves the acclaimed, and especially here in the tri-state area, since Bowens is from the tri-state area, as they put over on commentary, and as the tri-state area is very aware of. So, while the House of Black did not get booed during this match, very much so, the acclaim got cheered. The acclaimed were very hot coming into this. Max Caster was cutting a vicious rap on the House of Black, when they got jumped and things got extremely violent and came to a very abrupt end and then we come to the part of this video where things get real i wasn't really aware of what was happening when billy gunn started to unlace his boots I thought he was selling an injury, quite honestly. I, I wasn't expecting it at all. Um, in fact, my wife and one of my kids were away in the bathroom when this happened. And I was kind of only half paying attention. I, I was really surprised the match was over so quickly. And taken aback by the almost tender moment that Malachi Black had with Billy Gunn after the defeat where he got in very close, seemed to whisper something into his ear and kind of gave him a, a caress of his head. It's the best way to describe it. And so when this historic moment, I believe at this time, um, started to happen, you know, the emotions came up for sure. I, I mean, I don't have strong emotional feelings about, you know, Mr. Ass, usually, uh, Daddy Ass, Mr. Daddy Ass. I don't normally, you know, uh, I, I know some people in the audience definitely were impacted more emotionally than this than me. And it's certainly become quite an internet talking point at this point. Um, so being there live and being able to say, you know, I was there when, you know, Daddy Ass put his his boots in the middle of the ring is, is going to be something, uh, if this stands to actually be his retirement, something that's going to become a bit of a talking point for me as a wrestling, you know, content creator. Um, it was shocking to realize what was actually happening in front of me and the emotions on, you know, Billy Gunn's face while he was doing this were quite uh, jarring as they came through on the, on the big screen and when I was watching it later on television to get the full impact of this moment. And I don't know, from the way the match went down, from how abruptly that it ended, and the way everything was sold, and especially that moment between Malachi Black and 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 uh, and Billy Gunn in the middle of the ring, it just seemed like this was something that, you know, this is it. This is I believe that this is the retirement. If it's not, if it's a storyline, that's fine. But um, you know, Billy Gunn, he's he's definitely an older wrestler. He's in a phenomenal shape, of course, but. You know, as we get older, you know, risk of injury goes up. And the last thing I want to happen to a wrestler as they age is to be seriously injured in the ring. So if this is it for him, and I think it's a tactical move as well, because we've seen him do it with his sons. He's not really, he doesn't, he loves his sons. That's the storyline, of course. Um, he wanted to distance himself from it so that their star could rise. Because as long as a megastar like Billy Gunn is next to another wrestler, they're going to tend to eclipse them to a point they can raise their career. 
definitely the acclaimed have done well to have daddy ass with them. But at a certain point, it becomes detrimental as the crowd loves daddy ass perhaps more than the acclaimed. And that's not something that we want to see happen to young stars. We want them to make their own legacies. So I believe Billy Gunn is very cognizant of that and maybe he is going to move into more of a backstage role or a managerial role. But wow, what a powerful moment. And this is the moment that made me realize that I was in attendance for the best episode of Collision ever. That's right, guys. I really came around on this show right here. And if this show can keep with this trend of delivering emotional, impactful moments in wrestling via Collision, the TV show, then I think it has you know, a ton of potential. It could be just as good of a show as Dynamite. I know some people out there think Collision is instantly better than Dynamite. I feel that that might be some kind of bias in some way, shape, or form. I think objectively, if we're really going to look at this, clearly Dynamite is the superior program with superior matches and production. Look, it doesn't mean Collision isn't going to get there. And a moment like this really sold me on this TV show and its potential and what kind of things they could be doing. And and maybe this was a result of some of that. Um, there was a rumor that there was a backstage communication between CM Punk and the roster about, you know, what are we going to do to really elevate this show? This moment has elevated this show. So if this was something that Billy Gunn thought he could do to raise the show up, or maybe it was just his time to retire and this is just the place it happened, whether it was by happenstance or by design, these kind of moments are what we all live for in wrestling. This is what we want to see. Impactful, emotional moments. And wow, um, seeing that live was something else. Watching it back was also just really as impactful. I can't say it was much different. Um, just wow. Wow. Great show. Amazing show. And uh, there's still some left to go. So we're going to keep talking about it. I feel like this was really the whole point of the video, but I think we still got some more cool stuff on the way. And then FTR has to follow that with a FTR promo, which plays out like every FTR promo that's ever played out. Sorry, guys. You guys are great wrestlers, but the mic thing, uh, maybe not for you. I don't know. Get yourself a manager. Mr. Hartgrave's available. There's not much I want to say about the Sky Blue and Taya Valkyrie match other than, um, guys, Sky Blue is pretty young. So maybe chill out a little bit. Just saying. Also on the topic of Sky Blue on a quite serious note, she is quite a worker and might have taken some of the bigger bumps of the entire night. The match was kind of slow. It did get a This Is Wrestling chant live. I don't know if that really came through on the broadcast. Um, I actually think this actually played out better live than it did on TV for whatever reason. Um, maybe the sounds, maybe the atmosphere, something about it live. The pacing didn't seem as... Uh, slow uh, live. It seemed more impactful. Uh, maybe Sky Blue's selling came through a little bit better because we were able to, you know, I was able to watch her sell instead of having to watch. The camera was more focused on Taya Valkyrie on the broadcast and not so much on the selling that Sky Blue was doing, which was quite good. She's actually a really good seller. And I, I know a lot of the spots that she does, she actually proposes to do the crazier bumps that she ends up taking in matches like this. So hats off to her as a young worker, and I think she does have a bright future in this company. I would not be surprised if she gets like a major gimmick shift at some point and gets taken much more seriously. I'm kind of just waiting for that to happen. All right, so here it is, the main event, and I could probably make a whole video just on this weird relationship that CM Punk has with New Jersey, which he goes into a bit about at the end of the match as well. If you want to look that up, it's 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 kind of interesting what uh, he says to the crowd. But um, CM Punk comes out and everybody loves CM Punk. Everybody loves to sing Cult of Personality. There's no problems there. We like CM Punk. Everybody likes CM, just admit it. You like CM Punk. But it's also fun to boo CM Punk. So there's a lot of that in this match and uh, some very interesting moments with that as well. Um, so we got four members in here, 
four people in here. We got CM Punk, we got Darby Allen, we have Ricky Starks and Christian Cage. Everybody can agree that we hate Christian Cage. Everybody also seems to agree that we like Ricky Starks, but we also admit that we like Darby Allen even more. Everybody, no one can agree on how they feel about CM Punk. In fact, some audience members are still split to this day on whether they hate him or like him. It seems to come and go on a whim. A lot of this too is just like, it's fun to boo people. It's fun to boo people when you're not supposed to boo people. And CM Punk seems to enjoy it when we boo him. So I don't know. There's a weird audience dynamic in this and I'm going to say it's more fun than what was happening with Cody Rhodes. I mentioned Cody Rhodes earlier and that was very much that was very much more uncomfortable to witness happen. This thing that's going on with CM Punk isn't as disruptive to his work because he goes with it a little more. Uh, Cody Rhodes was kind of ignoring it, no selling it a lot and not really playing up to it. And when he did play up into it, it was kind of awkward. And it was just much better when he went to WWE and just got the cheers that his character was kind of designed to get and wasn't working against the grain so much. With CM Punk being booed, he's fine with it. It's really not going to throw him off. And in fact, it only kind of makes his game stronger. To that point, early on in the match, CM Punk and Darby Allen do a spot where CM Punk has Christian Cage in an arm bar and he goes to tag Darby Allen and the crowd pops. They're really excited. They really want to see Darby Allen wrestle. And he He tags back in CM Punk almost immediately while holding on to the arm bar and everyone boos and CM Punk sees this and he's like, oh, do you want Darby Allen back in? And everybody cheers and he tags in Darby Allen. Darby Allen comes in and goes, I'm going to tag CM Punk and everybody's booing and they do that back and forth and it's just a great little interplay and messing with the fickleness of the fans. I'm like, you guys get that CM Punk and Darby Allen are like IRL friends, right? Like they're teaming up. The whole storyline is, is that they're friends as well. The text is subtext. The whole thing is laid out for you. But these guys, they can't handle it, man. Do people even know why they're mad at CM Punk anymore? Like, what is your problem? I don't think that the Young Bucks and CM Punk or CM Punk and Kenny Omega, I don't even think they're feuding. I just think the Young Bucks don't want to mess around with this weird audience reaction that CM Punk gets. I think they would just like to be doing their own thing, working on their own legacy, putting out their own work. They're not in the point of their career where they want to play these games with audience reaction. CM Punk is happy to do it. I think Kenny Omega is fine to play around with it, but I understand that the Young Bucks at this point, just uh, their legacy is already kind of tenuous, right? Um, people already disrespect them enough online. I don't think they need it. I think they're right. I respect their decision, but hey, I also respect your decision if you want to boo CM Punk one moment and then cheer him the next. It just comes off as a little crazy, guys. So Darby uh, eventually is in there for a bit. He gets worked over to the point uh, where he finally gets the hot tag into CM Punk. CM Punk hits the ring, does a series of moves, does a cartwheel, and jumps up in the air. I'm not even lying. And this is a great match. This is actually one of the better matches that I've seen CM Punk in during his whole time in AEW. He looks great. He's having fun. He's being super athletic and he didn't even break his foot. Now, another thing that I noticed during this match that I want to call out is that at some times the crowd actually begins arguing with each other and in attendance i was a little concerned that there might be a riot because at one point in the match before cm punk really displays how not old he is there is a chant of cm old right um i was sitting like in the upper left and the upper right side of the arena begins up this CM old chant. Now, the floor decides that they've had enough of that crap and starts a shut the fuck up chant yelling at the audience. You can hear this on the playback. So if you listened and you heard the shut the fuck up chant and wanted to know what that was about, that was literally everyone on the floor 
telling everyone in the upper right to shut the fuck up with the CM old chance because guys, it is actually disrespectful, especially when this guy is still able to work his ass off in the ring and it can't be denied. Is he the best in the world? I don't know. Can he still work at a level comparable to what he used to be able to work at? Yeah, hell yeah. He's still got it, guys. CM Punk is not crap, um, at least not this time around. I know he had some issues last time around, breaking his foot. Man, at the buckshot lariat attempts. I mean, yeah, the botches were numerous and plentiful, but he looks like he's doing well. Let's give him a shot. I want to give him a shot. I'm excited about CM Punk doing some good work in the ring. Hey, his match against Samoa Joe was pretty good. I wasn't as, like, thrilled about it as everybody else was. I didn't really didn't really click with me. I hadn't seen the original matches with Samoa Joe, so I might need that context to really appreciate it. But CM Punk is looking great, looks great in the ring, and I thought it was really cool. And wow, man, the crowd reaction during this match was something else to be there. And that whole bit with the audience arguing with each other was was something else to be, behold. Hey, you know what? It felt like a punk rock show, and that's why this kind of fits CM Punk, because he is punk rock and this kind of audience reaction is kind of what you go for with that kind of stuff so it like makes sense what doesn't make sense at all is the end of this match this is where everything really fell apart for me and that is ricky starks wins by cheating he wins by pinning darby allen after cm punk hits the go to sleep on christian cage on the outside and knocks him the fuck out Ricky Starks is in the ring with Darby Allen and he pins him and he uses the ropes to win and now the audience absolutely loses their fucking mind, forgets how much more we love Darby Allen than everybody else in the ring and that's right everybody, they cheer Ricky Starks for getting the dirty win on Darby Allen while he celebrates next to Christian Cage. I can't fucking believe it, guys. I am so disappointed in New Jersey for not being able to hold the script for more than two fucking seconds. I swear to God, it's like we had the memory of goldfish at this point. Um, wow, guys. Uh, but it did wrap up a very amazing episode of Collision. I'm super excited for the next one, especially because it's going to feature a tag match between FTR and and MJF and Adam Cole, which is my favorite angle in all of wrestling. If you want to know about more things that I like about AEW wrestling, check out the other videos on this channel. Believe it or not, before I started covering AEW Fight Forever, I was just giving my takes about AEW, and that might actually be something that we kind of do a lot on this channel, because more than anything else, I'm an AEW wrestling fan. Like, hardcore guys. This is the stuff that I like about wrestling. This episode of Collision is what I like about wrestling. I really thought this was the strongest episode of Collision. Please let me know how you felt about it down in the comments below watching this at home or if you were actually in attendance as well. Hi fellow New Jerseyan. Um, anyways, there's a lot of other cool videos on this channel. Make sure you check them out and grave diggers keep digging.